Welcome, everybody. This is a special edition SMPT Standards Update webcast. This uh, webcast topic is moving into a coax-free world with uh, SMPT ST2059 and ST2071. I'm your host, Joel Welch, SMPT's Director of Education. I'd like to thank you all for joining. If this is your first time with SMPTE Standards Update webcasts, uh, we try to do them quarterly, although we just did one <laughs> last week, I think. And uh, they're one hour long. Uh, they're interactive, although the uh, interaction part is uh, mostly up to you folks. Uh, these uh, Standards Update webcasts are free of charge for everybody because we want to tell the world uh, about SIMPTE's uh, standards development projects and what we're doing with, with regard to standards, and sessions are recorded. Today's guest speaker is Patrick Waddell. He's Manager Standards and Regulatory for Harmonic Incorporated, and as you can see, he also is a SIMPTE Fellow. He's Chair of the ATSC's TSG S6 Group. He has a number of Emmys, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. Uh, Patrick, uh, you should have control. If you click on the slide, you should be able to advance them. The floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. Uh, what I'd like to talk with you about today is a topic that has been buzzing around the industry for a number of years, uh, which is moving media over IP and migrating the whole ecosystem that, that direction. Uh, if you think about it, the content's been digital for quite a while. The timing, however, has remained stubbornly analog. And, oh yeah, the remote control is typically done via RS-422 or similar serial, which I will say is virtually analog. Now, there have also been lots of evangelists that are just hyping IP. Oh, you're going to be IP tomorrow morning. Uh, but I think if you look at where the industry really is today, we're still coax. So perhaps there's more to this story than just this signal transport. So let's do a little onion peeling here and uh, dive into this. And for some of you, this may be breathlessly new. Others, this may be horribly boring. I hope to get a middle ground here. But let's take a look at the way we deal with images, because that's sort of the fundamental aspect of the business. So if you look at all of the SMPTE and ITUR production format standards, they are all carefully crafted to provide backwards compatibility with their analog predecessors. For SD, that's probably fairly obvious as to why that's the case. But actually, when you look at the HD standards, that may be less obvious. But if you have looked at the HD SMPTE standards, you'll see there's still analog waveforms drawn. Um, and if you think about the changes in technologies, the scanning systems haven't been radically changed. While we're not using CRTs anymore and not moving beams around, um, we're doing it the same way because we need to be backwards compatible. And you know, to manipulate the images in a production switcher or similar environment in a production facility, the scanning of each of the input images needs to be identical and synchronous. If you don't do that, you really see it on screen. And gee, the consequences of that we'll talk about. So if we think about the sort of the histories of the signals on a wire, in the analog days, we used 75 ohm coax. Now, early digital systems used parallel, and in some of the standards still provide for the parallel interfaces. Um, if you ever had the displeasure of keeping a parallel system alive, even when the machines were almost adjacent, it was ugly, it wasn't reliable, and it was something that the production staff hated as much as the engineers. SDI came along to provide the answer. And one of the things that, if you think about it, is fairly obvious, you stay with 75 ohm cable so you can reuse most of your existing wiring. Sometimes people had to change connectors because 
some old composite plants had used 50 ohm connectors, but cable uh, reuse was a major step to help. And the original target of the development was to get over 100 meters, and we've gone way past that. So we have you know, a loose group of interface specs, and I'll show you a partial list of them coming up in a few slides. We're dealing with unidirectional transport of uncompressed images, audio, and ancillary data. And the first standard came out in 1989. That's quite a while ago. So the way that SDI works is it transports the whole raster, which includes the vertical and horizontal blanking, uh, and those we reuse for data and audio. Um, so there's not a whole, whole much bunch of wasted bandwidth. Arguably, yes, we could do it more efficiently, but that would not be backwards compatible. And backwards compatibility remains a major goal. So SDI is the primary method for moving signals around a production plant. Higher data rates beyond 3 gig are indeed possible, and we now have documented both 6 gig and 12 gig interfaces, as well as some multi-link, quote unquote, interfaces. And let's take a look at some of, and this is a subset of the various standards. So for the, in the SD domain, we've got ST125, and that was revised a year or so ago to pick up a bunch of different ragtag documents done by both SMPTE and ITU. So it tries to bundle everything into one document at this point in time. Um, so that's sort of the key document to look at and look at the, I think it's 2015 edition, if you're interested in looking at it. Then we had ST274 that documented 1920 by 1080, ST296, which documented 1280 by 720p. And note that the numbers are not anywhere close to sequential. The HDSDI itself was documented in ST-292, uh, but that's now a multi-part document because we've got 292 part one, that's 1.5 gig signal and data interface. That's the 1080i 720p uh, classic um, interface rate. Then 292-2 uh, deals with dual 1.5 gigs uh, for stereo. And it's occasionally also levered into other applications. But the important thing to understand is 292 covers both the 274 and the 296 image formats. Then moving into the brave new world of tomorrow, we now have 424 that documents 3 gigabits. So as I said, this is just a subset. It didn't list the uh, documents moving beyond three gigs. If we look at the audio side of things, we see that we've got AES-3, which was once referred to usually as AES-EBU, um, which deals with the transport of digital audio. Uh, and that is even older than ST-125. It was published in 1985 by aes it was aimed at twisted pair, not coax. That's an important thing to understand if you're not really familiar with AES-3. So it carried two channels of stereo, you know, of PCM uh, at a variety of sample rates and a variety of bit depths. It also has channel status and other, you know, Nascent metadata, I guess, is maybe the best way to phrase it. Uh, it can be used to carry non-PCM digital data. That was one of the smart things the AES committee did, is they had a data bit, and SMPTE promptly made use of that. So we have ST-377 and its associated documents that deal with non-PCM audio over AES-3. 
And in fact, we are adding to that group of documents. Uh, we're going to be adding documentation for uh, AC4, for DTS, and for MPEG-H uh, in sort of the universe of these uh, standards. So that's work that's undergo underway in uh, SMPT right now. The bits in AES-3 are carried using something called biphase mark, and that's a particular uh, electrical coding style. It's easy to recover the clock. That's you know sort of goal number one when you're making it a digital interface. And in the case of AES-3, they also wanted to minimize the DC component on the line because many balanced lines went into transformers at the receiver. Uh, and so you really didn't want to have DC current flow through a transformer. The, uh, the way they did the sync was they uh, specified it puts an illegal biphase mark uh, code word, and they said, okay, that means this, and the other one means that, and that's the way you identify your blocks and your frames. It crude but effective, and we've been using it since. So let's see. There we go. Um, AES-10 is the other major digital audio interface. It's sometimes known as MADI. It carries up to 64 channels, and it's oriented only toward pro applications. So it's 48 kilohertz, 24 bits. Uh, they reuse a lot of the channel data and so forth from AES-3, but they make use of a constant 125 megahertz clock. So the clock recovery is less onerous. They make use of a, a four bits and five scheme for coding the stuff. And this one was first published in 1991, so it's fairly old, um, but widely deployed. Uh, AES-3 and AES-10 are ubiquitous in the pro audio space. Um, the other thing, though, about AES-3 data is that for television applications, we typically embed it so that when you've got SDI, HDSDI, or 3 gig SDI, you almost always have got audio in there as well. And we made provisions for that in ST272, which was the first uh, embedding standard, and 299 that came along later to document both the 24-bit sample depth as well as the wider uh, space in the horizontal blanking areas in the HD signals. So you carry a lot more audio in HD than you could in SD. So since we said initially we wanted to talk about doing this stuff over IP, let's take a look at what it takes to do SDI over IP. This is documented by ST2022 Part 6 with optional FEC that's documented in part five. What's important, especially for those of you that are in the studio end of things, or the operations end of things, is that this was originally documented for long haul applications. Wasn't documented to be switched. And in studio at that point in time, what's not considered by the committee as being in scope. So they just didn't, they ignored the topic. It's somewhat like MPEG-2 TS, where the assumption of the standard is it's always been on the wire, it always will be on the wire, there's no provision to do anything other than think to it. And same sort of paradigm. Um, so the SDI or HD-SDI flows thus are contiguous in a given signal. So you don't try to align for rasters. Devices that are receiving the signal must parse the flow to find the top of frame and then begin to lock themselves up to do whatever recovery of the SDI uh, that they need to do for processing. FEC, please note, is probably not necessary for studio applications. There are some parts of the world, like Arizona or New Mexico, where you have a monsoon season with lots of thunderstorms, there I would expect studio operators will use FEC probably in August 
Uh, maybe not the rest of the time. Um, but there are other methods for error correction that are now documented in 2022, specifically part seven, which is called seamless protection switching of 2022 IP datagrams. And that works using path redundancy. So there's more than one way to handle the flawless recovery of IP signals. But returning to the industry conundrum, we have a legacy legacy. Almost every operator has existing facilities. All the new gear has to easily fit into those facilities. It cannot disrupt the workflow or system architecture. So we figured out long ago how to do this. We built islands. We built, for example, digital standards def islands in analog standard def systems. And then we turned around and we built digital HD islands in digital SD systems and so forth. So we know how to do this. And that's how I expect that operators are going to approach migrating into IP. But we need to be able to time the gear. So currently, as I commented up at the beginning, we're using an analog signal called Blackburst. There's another one that we sometimes use in HD plants called Tri-Level Sync, and we'll show you what those look like if you haven't seen them before coming up. But the bad news aspect for somebody that's building a television facility is that you put as much wire in the floor for sync as you do for the video, sometimes even more. Um, and then, oh yes, don't forget device control. So you've got a lot of wiring running around that costs money, miles and miles of it in a big facility. And so the way that we tie this gear together is the Genlock, uh, and note that Genlock is a shorthand for generator lock. Um, that translates into usually sending things via star topology from a master generator. We use typically lots of distribution amplifiers to make the thousands of copies you may need. Um, sometimes you use the ability to loop uh, signals from one device to another but that makes for maintenance issues. Somebody takes something out of a rack and disconnects a cable, then you know, it's off air. Um, the reference signal, though, is used by the devices as their timing reference. So that's how they can generate synchronous outputs. And that's how, if they're doing internal manipulation, and frequently things like production switchers, um, digital effects units, um, playout servers, and so forth that are today doing overlays and effects. They've got to have a clean internal sync and matching video locked. In the audio domain, we've got the same issue. We've got a digital audio reference signal, sometimes called DARS, um, creates a lot of the same problems. Wonderful if we can get away from it. Well, we will. But first, if you've never seen what either Blackburst or Tri-Level looks like, here it is. So these will be in the handouts. You can study them if you need to. Um, back to the other topic that I raised earlier, device control. Right now, we're running serial cables, typically between control rooms and the equipment rooms. You've got to be able to reconfigure and maintain this. So, gee, we have these funky patch panels that have nine-pin connectors and other such wonders. Um, there's lots of proprietary protocols out there, a great deal of variance even within the de facto standards because there certain widely deployed companies have become de facto standards. And having spent many years in, in a facility supporting production staff, it wasn't plug and play. We'd like to get to plug and play. Oh, and then there's yet another signal we need to think about, time code. Because we use time code to provide a label for frames of video. 
We also use it for indexing audio, but usually a little more granularly. It's typically stored alongside the video and the audio content, though, so that we know when the frame was captured or the edit was done. There's two types of timecode code words. This is fairly old technology, but nonetheless, we have LTC, which used to be recorded along the link of a tape, and VITC, or VITC, which is recorded typically in the vertical interval. And that was done so that if the deck was paused, you could still recover what time the frame was. We've moved on beyond those two reasonably pr primitive uh, mechanisms and are using something called ATC, which is what typically is used for the HD decks. Um, still the same code words, but time code is vital for a facility. And so what we do typically is we have a master time code generator and we feed its output to almost everywhere in the plant uh, and frequently we don't put genlock signals on it so you typically have another parallel layer of wires the application that we're discussing now is time labeling and we're using the 121 time code code words they are limited in capability they can only deal with up to 30 hertz signals. We can identify pairs up to 60. We're working at the moment to try to extend beyond 60 into high frame rates, but that work is not done yet. But the real purpose from an operational viewpoint is to line up the recorded media in production or post-production. This is what most edit systems are driven by. This is what most of your tape or server operators are paying attention to as they're waiting to get stuff lined up to go on air in a live production. It's good old time code. So facility wiring ends up being one of those elephants in the room because you've got to plan it, you've got to build it, you've got to document and maintain it. And if you don't do it right, you discover you may have painted yourself into the proverbial corner. So the, the appeal of function collapse of carrying you know, the, the video, the audio, the control on one wire is really, really strong. Um, but even as we get able to do that, we're not going to be able to get away from good network engineering. Network engineering is probably going to get even more important than it is right now. So let's take a very quick look at what a block diagram of a dumb, simple facility might look like. So this is about as you know, simple as you can imagine. Uh, we typically draw video routers as use and then put stuff either inside or feeding one side or the other. So if we put synchronization on top of this, here's what we're talking about. As I said earlier, we use a star topology, and that translates in defeating black burst to you know, the router, the server, the switcher, you know things like logo inserters. We have to feed DARS to the audio mixer because the audio samples need to be lined up with the video samples, otherwise we hear pops and clicks. So synchronization is vital. Then if we put time code in over the top of this, we have yet another start topology, and we can typically slave uh, the time code generator to uh, GPS, although sometimes they're tied to other time standards. The good news about the left side of the diagram is usually that's a single box that you can buy from multiple vendors that do all three functions. But that's still a lot of wire. So if we're going to move to replace Black Burst, we need to be aware of a number of developments in standards. 
first and from my point of view most important because I'm the chair of the group that has created these two documents. Um, SD2059 Part 1, which deals with the generation and alignment of interface signals to the SMPTE epoch, and 2059 Part 2, which is the SMPTE profile for the use of IEEE 1588 Precision Time Protocol in professional broadcast applications. So the first thing to note is that we're leveraging a very widely deployed IEEE standard, which is 1588 and we usually refer to it as PTP rather than by its long name. And then we also bring into this new concept called an epoch. Ooh, what's an epoch? This sounds you know, positively biblical. Um, if you think about the way video signals are constructed, they're very repetitive. So a signal generator that knows the time with good accuracy can compute when do I need to spit the next frame of video down the, the wire? And it needs to be able to do that knowing both where we are, what time it is looking at my wristwatch, as well as where am I starting from. And the starting point is called an epoch. So generating video from time is actually, well, it's conceptually jarring when you first start thinking about it, it's sort of now, um, it's actually not tough. So what we need is that starting point, and then we are able to say, when is the top of the next frame due? And you know then when to start generating that and putting it on the wire. So 1588 defined their epoch as the 1st of January 1970 at midnight, TAI which is different than UTC. And then they have a, a comma, and they tell you what's the difference from UTC. That was the difference as of that instant in time. The difference is different now. Uh, 2059 Part 1 adopted that epoch. It was, after the group wrestled with the decision for a while, it was pretty obvious that that was the right thing to do. The translation of PTP time values into other time bases is easy. It's basic constant offset and some math. So this is very straightforward. And we can also generate the time of day code words from the PTP time. So we have a single time base to do both video and time code. That's good news. Begin to get rid of some wires. So how do we do this? If we think about when the top of the next picture, next vertical interval is going to be, that's the top of the raster. We looked at that drawing earlier. So if we give it a handy engineering type name and say, oh, it's the next alignment point, we have a straightforward calculation. And this is pulled out of 2059 part one. So um, we're doing math on the horizontal rates and the vertical rates times some magic overall time rate, which turns out will be related to frame rate and the size of the images, and then calculating against the time, the PTP time that's on the, on the system right now. So as you would expect, these are frame rate dependent. And if we look at standard definition only, I'll leave it as exercise for the readers uh, or the students to uh, chase down the HDs and the rest. Uh, it's all in 2059 Part 1. So we have a counter for, say, digital SD, and we'll just do, because I'm a North American, I will do 525 lines. Uh, we discover that our counter is running at 13.5 megahertz, and we get that out of the table that's given. Note the right-hand column with the circled SR. And we started the counter at zero at the epoch. Then the time between each frame is going to be one frame period. And you calculate that by taking the number of lines, V, times the number of samples per line, H, as we did on the 
previous slide. And we then do a modulus operator, which is the remainder from the division of the two integers, to get the alignment point. And typically, once a device is up and aligned to the uh, alignment point, it can just take off and go because it runs its own clocks knowing what time it needs to for the format of video that it's dealing with. So this is not hard. Um, a little bit more about IEEE 1588, however. The timestamps, they're 80 bits long. That may seem like that's a lot, but 48 bits of those are for seconds, and 32 bits are for nanoseconds, so it's accurate. We can deal with things down to nanosecond level. The idea was this would not be a time base that was going to run out of steam in 50 years like some other time bases that are out there will. So that was the driver for the IEEE group to pick this particular format. The 1588 is both complex, it's rich in features, and it's widely supported. And as I note, that's good news and bad news. Um, but this is everywhere. It runs the cell phone system. It runs, at least in North America, the power grid. It runs probably most automated uh, factories around the planet. Um, further, they provide for profiles, which are extensions and constraints to the base PTP document that are available to SDO, Standards Development Organizations, like SMPTE. So it's not made available to manufacturers, it's SDOs. So we have now a SMPTE profile, and that's SD2059 Part 2. And what's magic about 1588? Well, it synchronizes real-time clocks in distributed network systems. And it does that in a very efficient and reliable way. It's based on time and not on receipt of event-based not notification messages. So the receiving device has its own time base that is stabilized, not based on the receipt of an event, but on messages that say, here's what time it is, and you can compare your clock against that and make adjustments if appropriate or not and algorithms are provided to have everybody do it all the same way. A device that knows the time accurately enough knows how to generate synchronous outputs. So that answers our issue of how do we get everything locked to the same point in the video signal. One of the things that they did when they made the revision in 2008 to create 1588-2008 was they provided for a variety of update rates and network topologies, and especially rapid reconfiguration after network changes, and they worked very hard on fault tolerance. If you think about running a thing as complex as the cell phone network, you've got to be able to deal with faults. So that's very carefully addressed in the documents. One of the nice consequences is it's widely supported on both Phi chips, so if you're building devices and you're you know, buying somebody's Ethernet implementation, it's going to have PTP in it almost certainly. Uh, the other good news from a user point of view is the blade servers that folks want to be able to lever and have products on, they're universally supporting PTP. So. This is an important um, technology for the SMPTE universe to begin to make use of, and we'll discover we're not alone. The AES folks have adopted it as well. So as I noted, um, they wisely provided for profiles, and um, a number have been published. Power, Telcom, IETF has even built one, and now SMPTE. A um, couple of important things from a simply user viewpoint. Um, 1588 is set up primarily for auto negotiation between devices so that if you're a box and you get plugged in the wall and hooked up to 
Ethernet and you get 1588 messages, you have to say, who am I? What am I doing? And that may take a while. In television applications, we know typically that we're a slave we, or we know we're a master. So we can tell the device ahead of time. And our profile says that's legal to do. So you can say, I'm going to be a slave and I'm not going to have to handshake. Think about all the monitors that we've got. Um, you know, you don't want monitors up negotiating to see whether they can be a grandmaster. Um, we have some specific options that are permitted. We have some that are specifically prohibited. Um, we can have alternate master nodes, a uh, number of things designed for television and media applications. One of the most important ones is something called Daily Jam. Daily Jam? Well, that's not something that you have in the morning with toast. Um, it's an optional daily procedure carried out daily if you're using 12-1 time code for your time addresses. Um, typically, it's done in the early hours of the morning because it's going to disrupt the time base for a few frames. Um, it's used for fractional frame rate systems and drop frame time code. If you don't do it, you're going to slide out of lock with the wall clock by about 86 milliseconds a day. And so by the end of a week, people would see that you were a few seconds out. Um, even if you're not doing drop frame and fractional frame rates, you would probably do at least two daily jams a year to deal with the daylight savings adjustments. And oh, yes, when you need to do UTC leap seconds. So that's why we have daily jam, even if it's not daily in all cases. So what's in uh, 2059 part one? Well, first it defines the epoch. We've already looked at that. And then it provides the necessary formulas for video signal generation, audio signal generation, and 12 part one time code code word generation. And the formulas cover everything from analog composite SD through all of the digital formats as well as the analog HD, because there may be people using that, um, and certainly the digital HD, and then off to UHD. Um, so you have the also formulas for dealing with the audio-video cadences for fractional frame rate audio. And uh, it requires that new interface documents that SIMTI will write in the future um, will provide the alignment point specification and the formula for their signal generation as part of their document so we don't have to keep touching 2059 part one. So what's in part two? Well, the SIMTI profile. Um, and as you might imagine, it's all the elements required by IEEE 1588 for a profile because they tell us what they want. And we also provide for jam events, which are also called time jumps. And there's the definition of a time jump. Um, it's recommended that both parts of the document be read together, especially if you're a manufacturer of equipment. Your engineers need to see the big picture, not just one part or the other. So tell them to make sure they read both. So if we want to move forward and help people build islands, we need to think in terms of how are you going to migrate? Well, there are folks already building black burst generators that have PTP lock capability. And the time of day time code now comes along for free on the PTP, so you may not need to run time code wiring into that IP island. Um, so we can hopefully begin to diminish the cost of black burst wiring uh, over the next couple of years. But we still haven't talked about device control. That's the remaining topic. Well. If we're going to move beyond point-to-point -point serial, we need some new features that are not just the data comm. Uh, if you think about it, manual configuration of the control system doesn't scale. 
you also need to deal with security when you're dealing with a serial connection where you knew it was connected on both ends and probably not being eavesdropped upon, uh, security was less of a worry. Um, but if you think about what this is beginning to sound like, it's the Internet of Things. And that, I think we're all aware, is a hot topic in the public press. So when people say Internet of Things, I think this is usually the sort of illustration that you see. Um, so what's the application in the professional media space? Well, we've got our own Internet of Things, and this is one that most of you probably at least have seen before. Um, this is an ESPN live control room. Uh, take and note the clock on the wall. The game hasn't started yet, uh, but everybody's in position and ready to go. Um, but that's what we're talking about. So how do we make this work? Well, the Internet of Things is an Internet-like structure of uniquely identified objects. And I think this paradigm is reasonably familiar. What's an object? Well, in most cases, it's a you know, computer or software or whatever. It can also be a service. It can also be data. So your media is an object. And it's got to be identifiable, so it's got an identity. So it makes it unique from all other objects. And so there's a number of ways of identifying objects. Uh, and it needs to be accessible from a variety of places so that it's not tied to a physical in instance. Um, and you want to make sure that you're not describing the functionality you want to talk about what the object is. So this really is a conceptual extension of the Internet. Uh, there's lots of protocols out there, lots of implementations. Most of them have been aimed at consumer applications, but we've got one of our own, and we're going to drill down into that. So what is the Internet of Things lacking? So what, what will SMPTE have to document here to make use of this approach? Um, we've got what is often referred to as the basket of remotes conundrum. You reach for the remote on the table in front of you, and oh, nuts, that's not the telly, it's the receiver, or it's not the DVD player, right? So you've got a whole lot of remotes. So we've got lots and lots of objects. And so we need to be able to find them and control them, make sure that all of this interoperates. So part of what needs to be documented in defining a media-centric Internet of Things is object discovery. It needs to be as close to automatic as you can make it. So we lever something that we've known and loved, even if we don't know that we're knowing and loving it. It's called DNS. Uh, that's how device names get uh, dealt with when you type, you know, www.google.com, that's what's happening. Um, there's a well-known uh, simple service discovery protocol that we can lever. There's a number of proprietary protocols, but we try not to make use of those. There are going to be some hooks so that people can continue to use what they're doing. Objects need to be able to say what they are. Uh, and what their capabilities are. So that's an important thing to think about because you can't have humans stopping and telling a edit system what the, you know device is. Um, so the you want implementations to focus on you know the the granular features like the play stop pause commands. Uh, you can probably have some higher level stuff, but this is. Uh, something that takes focus and understanding. And so we discover that there is a new set of standards from SMPTE that the oldest have been out for about three years. And this is 2071, which was listed on the uh, initial slide. Um, it's now got five parts. So we have Part one deals with the media device control framework, 
It's sort of the how does all this fit together? There's now part two is the protocol. So it is actually not intended to be the only protocol, but it is a sample interoperable protocol. Then there's part three, which was published uh, in 2014, which deals with the discovery aspect. There's two that have yet to get completed and published. One is the capability interface repository, and that is slow because there's security signing, uh, who hosts it, these sorts of issues that are being worked on. And then last, there is a widely used technology called REST that isn't well documented, and so we're probably going to have to document it to get a, a referenceable SMPTE document. But the, uh, the important thing that is kept in mind by the group that's working on this is it's got a scale. So let's quickly drill into some of this. It's based on capabilities, not the de devices themselves. So you say, what are you able to do? And you try to keep that as you know atomic as possible. Uh, so Lego blocks is a good way to think about it. The requirement is that the implementers need to define their own capabilities because we don't know all the devices we're going to have in this space in the future. And what, you know, we don't need to be changing the standard to add something new. Um, then we have uh, the whole concept of capability-based design, and you want to define the behavior and not the object itself. So here's very quickly what's in part one. And here very quickly is what's in part two. These use state-of-the-art stuff. This is a lot of this is what keeps the internet afloat. And part of the focus has been to make sure security is built in from the jump. It needs to, and does address both IPv4 and IPv6. The capability repository is something where we're probably going to be able to get some synergy out of some complementary work going on in AES, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the you know the logistics about who's going to host, how how are we going to charge for it? You know, probably manufacturers will need to pay a fee to get their stuff up, and that's all that's being worked on. And the RESTful interface is uh, last and certainly not least. REST, it turns out, is something that seems so obvious that people have not stopped to write good, crisp definitions of everything, which means we don't have a document to reference to say, here's what REST is, so we will have to write one. And then we have discovered that meanwhile in the AES, they've got a project called X210, which is open control architecture. They're trying to solve a similar but different Internet of Things problem. It turns out it's complementary to what 2071 does because it's focused on what's going on inside of the device. So if you think about an you know, audio mixing console, you've got a whole lot of controls, and you need to be able to express, you know, where is the, which pan pot am I and how am I turned and all that level of stuff. We're discussing with AES how to ensure harmony and see if we maybe can arrange for joint um, meetings between the respective committees. AES has also done their own PTP profile, which is AES 67. That's not the only part that AES 67 documents, but uh, AES 67 is out there. We expect that it will interoperate with 2059, and there will be some testing done on both sides to ensure that that's happening. So what's the takeaway here? Well. The IP transport's available, and it interoperates. That's fairly bulletproof right now. The system timing is now available. And uh, I would like to note that my working group, uh, 32NF80, will be doing interop testing to ensure that everybody is interoperable. 
I would expect that these tests will run for several years. So we may do three tests a year um, yeah, because there's companies, as I discovered uh, in the Sydney meetings, that just discovered that 2059 had been published. So people are starting to design. Um, and now the other part of this is the IP-based control is available. There are some implementations. I would urge you, if you're interested in this topic, to read Steve Posick's uh, well-done article in the SIMTI journal that ended up being bumped out of the paper copy in the su supplement land. There's the URL for it. You should be able to click on the URL in the handout and get a copy. If you so last thing is I'd like to encourage the users in this group to start asking your favorite vendors for support, not just of 2022, but also 2059 and 2071, because frequently vendors don't build stuff until they hear customers saying, ah, what about? And you should also be thinking about, you know, how are you going to start adding IP islands? Where do they make sense? How do you get them in and, and uh, not disrupt your workflow? So last, a trip down memory lane, this is totally gratuitous, but this is something I found on YouTube. There's an NBC training videotape that was done for non-technical people back in 1979. Um, it shows the technology we were using in 75 very nicely, but it also includes splice editing two-inch videotape, which, if you weren't aware, is the way that Laugh-In was edited. So. Last, I'd like to express my gratitude to Steve Posick, who is the father of ST2071 and who furnished uh, the pictures and a uh, fair amount of material in 2071. So, Joel, I think we're done. And thank you all for uh, your attention. Thank you, Patrick. And we are done except for the Q&A period. Um, I would like to invite our guests to uh, submit questions using the chat function or the question function, however it's labeled in your control panel. Uh, but uh, also consider, please, uh, asking a verbal question. Just, just write that I'd like to ask a verbal question, and I'll unmute you so you can speak directly to Pat and then remute you uh, at the end. Uh, Pat, we do have uh, one question. I'm going to ask it, and then I'm going to ask you to explain what it means just a little bit. Um, we have one. Uh, the question is, you know, I think earlier in the presentation you spoke about FEC, which in uh, most cases means forward error correction. Is, was that the, uh, the term that was intended for uh, this presentation? Yes, it is. Would and you, the FEC, the 2022 documents, is if you're a true uh, forward error correction guru and you work for a transmission company, you probably would say, ah, oh, this isn't FEC. But it turns out it is uh, very adequate for uh, IP-based networks. It is done with exclusive OR operations, so it's fairly quick to do. Uh, it gets transmitted out of a different uh, port number uh, and sent to the same device, again, different port number. And it adds latency to the system, and that's one reason why for studio applications, Probably people are not going to make heavy use of it because it slows things down. But yes, it's forward error correction indeed. What uh, could you just very high level, just thirty seconds or less, explain what it does? Yeah, um, what it does is it allows the uh, sending of packets that match the media packets. That if you lose a media packet either due to a bit error, and if you understand IP, it is very bit error intolerant, so that things automatically throw away packets, um, so you can reconstruct a missing packet. Or if you get them out of sequence number and then discover you're missing a packet, you can recreate it using the inverse operation of this FEC. I would encourage folks, if you are interested in diving deeper into either 2059 or 2071 for future 
sessions of Joel's series on standard updates, I'm happy to do that. So just ask Joel, and we can arrange to dive into whichever topic or both topics that you'd like to talk about, because there's a whole lot there to talk about. Um, that uh, There are still no questions, Patrick, so I would think we'll call it a day. And I'd like to thank you very much for putting this together. hope it was uh, relatively painless. Oh, you're most welcome. Good, good, good. Um, appreciate uh, taking the time. And I'd like to thank our guests for uh, sitting with us and um, listening uh, to the presentation. With that, we'll call it a day. Uh, safe travels if you're going someplace, but uh, hope to see you in a future webcast, either one of SIMPTE's monthly educational webcasts, standards update webcasts, emerging technology webcasts, or if you're an executive member, uh, then the uh, executive member strategy briefing webcast. Thanks to all. Take care. See you next time.